Ah, hello, and welcome back to Halloween. Every year I do something special for Halloween, and well, last year I did a rather Halloween-themed video essay, which to this day is one of my favorite videos I've ever done. I've never done an actual Halloween video essay. Well, no more. I promise you, from now until the end of this channel, I will make a Halloween special every year. Until the end of time. That is a promise I will definitely not regret ever making. Ever. No siree. Anyway, Halloween. It's a pretty fun holiday, right? It's got so many fun elements to it. Candy, costume, fear, dread, horror, murder, and of course, completely rotted corpses. Yeah. So in pop culture, skeletons are primarily known for their wackiness and bone-rattling shenanigans, which is weird, right? I mean, it's a skeleton. Skeletons generally only show up when someone dies and has been dead for a very long time. But most of the time, modern media associates them with crappy puns and playing their rib cages like xylophones. Or at the very least, with them being rather silly. The most prominent example people can think of when they're asked about skeleton characters is like, Skeletor. You furry flea-bitten fool, I'll cover my throne with your hide! Or the characters from Coco. Or even Papyrus and Sans from Undertale. Though the, actually that last one is pretty scary at times. So why is there such a disconnect between these two realities? Well, in this short little TSC Talk spooky season special, I hope to answer that question. So grab your funny bones and let's get cracking. While I was researching this video, I found it odd that almost no one seemed to talk about this topic. I mean, I found one actual academic source, one Reddit post wondering about this question, r slash Dark Souls 3, and the rest of the results were lists of humorous skeleton puns. And this article from Lapham's Quarterly that I found is something else. It's full of lines like, The sudden display of Ossesius apparatus shook the class from our lunch-induced stupor. Blithe reaction of my science class to such a bony bandage can be seen as something of an anomaly. Jokes would have been unthinkable in the anatomical amphitheaters of prior centuries. I really stick my neck out for you guys here, is all I'm saying. Call me Doug Walker, because I have to remember what this says so that you don't have to. Anyway, in summary, skeletons have historically been used as symbols of death. It makes sense. As I mentioned, there is a certain morbidity to uh, what would bring a skeleton to the forefront, let's just say. And in a time period where people die younger and more often and generally aren't very good about burying their dead, it makes sense that more people would have seen skeletons as a very real reminder of death. And for many, that association with death translated to honoring skeletons as a way to honor the dead. In Hyodratophobia, a 1658 discourse on burial customs, Thomas Brown wrote that to be knaved of our graves, to have our skulls made drinking bowls and our bones turned to pipes, to delight and sport our enemies are tragical abominations. So, Brown would really hate Spirit Halloween, huh? <laughs> Anyway, this attitude would start to change a lot as the idea of Memento Mori became more popular. For those of you that don't know, Memento Mori is Latin for remember death, or remember that you will die. And it's certainly a thought I have never had before and never dwelled upon for any length of time. Memento Mori as an idea has shown up a lot throughout history as an artistic motif, with death often being depicted as a skeleton. This is why the Grim Reaper is generally depicted as a skeleton, and noticeably why the Grim Reaper is generally an exception from the silly skeletons rule. Generally. It's the differences that make our world so rich, diverse, and wonderful. I still hate you though. One popular artistic depiction of Memento Mori has been the Dance Macabre, or Dance with Death, which, as you may have guessed, depicts one dancing with death. Big surprise there. As a kind of symbolic acceptance of one's mortality. And in that way, it honored death, as was the custom. However, there was one factor that the artistic world could not account for. The never-ending, forward-moving pace of science. Throughout the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, there was a huge push for scientific development in a way not really seen before. And one of the key areas of technological development was medicine. With the advent of medical technologies like more refined surgery tools, germ theory, and the better understanding of how to make drugs that would help people, drugs like... Uh, drugs and compounds. Don't worry, it gets way more specific with really helpful health supplements like opium and arsenic. Yeah, the medical technologies were better, but they weren't exactly informed yet. 
Anyway, even though they weren't exactly fully informed, the medical and technological advances were starting to curb people's mortality rates, even if just a little bit at a time. As such, people at large were generally starting to see death less as an ever-present threat and more as a distant idea that didn't need to be confronted right away. If little Timmy isn't going to be constantly on the verge of death from sepsis, you really don't need to be thinking about death nearly as much. Something else that was starting to happen was that as scientific developments continued, skeletons were starting to be separated from their doom and gloom context. Medical conventions and institutions started using skeletons for classroom discussions and lectures. The impenetrable symbol of death and despair was, in some cases quite literally, dissected. And as seems to be the case for some reason, the skeleton's new association with an educational environment really started to attract the class clowns, in the form of both students and teachers alike. In 1792, Scottish Dr. John Hunter once gave a lecture to a single attendee, which became two attendees when he stopped the lecture, pulled out a skeleton, sat it down in the audience, and then returned to his lecture as if nothing had happened. After this, it was pretty much a free-for-all. Everyone was making light of skeletal presences, from American author Mark Twain, describing a skeletal prank in his book A Tramp Aboard, Aboard. to a 1921 case of a 13-year-old boy in New York City finding a skeleton and just taking it on a walk while terrorizing his neighbors. New Yorkers have just kind of always been like that, huh? After this, we see the idea translating to American media. A small little up-and-coming production studio by the name of Walt Disney Productions, then just producing short animations, released two shorts in their Silly Symphony series, Skeleton Dance and The Haunted House, with both featuring rather silly and intimidating only in a cartoonish sense collections of skeletons who danced, scrambled their bones, played their rib cages like xylophones, and generally just goofed around before piling into a coffin before sunrise. Not exactly deserving of the same reverence as skeletons of the 1600s. Skeletons and media continued to have a rather cheesy element to them, with the infamous skeleton warriors in Jason and the Argonauts being a prime example. Skeletons have also pretty heavily been associated with Pirates, yeah. a group who in pop culture have been pretty heavily associated with theatrics and flamboyancy since Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. The trend in media continues to evolve to this day, with internet cultural examples like Tumblr's Skeleton War and the use of I'm dead and the skull emoji to indicate laughter. Speaking of the internet, one of the comments on that r slash Dark Souls 3 post actually had an interesting insight into this, which is a sentence I never thought I'd say, but here we are. Reddit user Rian says, a major Part of it is probably that skeletons are always grinning since they have no lips. Culturally, that has set up an association between skeletons and laughing, and that gradually developed into them seeming inherently silly. Historically, as we've explored, that's not always accurate, but that association with grinning does evoke a kind of absurdity. It's also possible that since skeletons are devoid of a lot of obviously human features at first glance, they don't fall into the uncanny valley in the same way that regular corpses or by extension zombies do. Plus, the general absurdity of a skeleton moving around on its own or even just sticking together without any kind of clear way it does is just kind of hilarious. Another larger factor has been the influence of other cultures. I've mostly just been talking about the European perspective on death and skeletons, but not everyone has the same ideas about these near-universal topics. In Mexico, for example, skeletons are symbols of death, but death isn't something to be feared culturally. Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead, is a holiday that celebrates the lives and memories of those who have passed rather than commiserating over the fact that they're dead. A large part of this celebration is skeleton imagery, particularly the calavera or sugar skull, an artistic representation of a skull decorated colorfully with drawings of flowers, animals, and others. Sugar skulls and skeletons are key parts of this celebration of life, showing up on decorations, altars, and even people's faces. In this way, skulls and skeletons are associated with a light-hearted tradition. And considering the close proximity of Mexico to the US, it's not hard to infer that the traditions of Dia de los Muertos influenced our own fall-based holiday revolving around the spirits of the dead. I'm not going to go through the whole long complex history of Halloween, at least not now. Not that it isn't interesting, but it's also not very relevant. All I wanted to bring up was the fact that Halloween is very popular in America. And you know what else is very popular in America? Capitalism. 
Now admittedly, this is just speculation on my part, but I don't think it's a coincidence that as a horror-themed holiday became more profitable and more popular with the general audience, and appealed more to mainstream audiences, the horror icons of Americana became more marketable as well. And skeletons have definitely been victims of this ever-present existential horror destroying the very fabric of our reality. Happy Halloween! In conclusion, this has been a pretty surface level look at what I'm sure is a very complicated topic with a lot of factors, but I just kind of wanted to get the ball rolling because this is a question that has been bothering me or intriguing me recently. I hope that I piqued your interest and gave you something to think about, or at the very least got you into this spooky spirit on this very fine All Hallows Eve. Feel free to check out my socials, including the channel Discord server, as well as my Patreon page. If you want to help support me in the channel, feel free to consider donating. At the lowest here you get early access to all videos, the ability to vote on patron exclusive polls, and your name in the credits of every single one of my videos. Thank you so much to all my patrons, and if you can't or don't want to join the Patreon but still want to support the channel, feel free to like the video, comment with any thoughts you may or may not have had, share it with anyone you think might like it, or even subscribe for more of that sweet, sweet content. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed this video and that I made your day just that little bit spookier. And don't forget, Skeletons may be funny, but there are far scarier things that can be in your closet tonight. Happy Halloween. <laughs>